my outlets are upside down, and I'll argue that in a bit, but I'm just about ready to move in and I'm gonna show you everything, including the wall mount network rack I just set up in the back. And some people thought those white labels on the black wall jacks were horrid, and yes, I agree. Those labels were just until this black label tape came in. Oh, and since construction dust wasn't so bad anymore, I finally unwrapped this little media rack that I've been storing here. A local high school was upgrading a media setup and they were getting rid of this rack, so thanks Nearings Hall. Some of my favorite furniture I got for cheap or free, and I'm glad the first official piece of furniture here is recycling a bit of old gear from somewhere else local. It's serving as a workbench right now, but it'll be under my desk soon. But off with the old label and on with the new. The white on black does look a little bit nicer. Also, a bunch of people suggested some home assistant automations, and I did one of them. When I arm the security system now, it automatically turns off all the lights. So that's nice, and keep your suggestions coming. And I found a nice deal on this fridge on Black Friday, and it turns out reversing the door on the thing actually takes a bit of work. I thought it would be a couple minutes, but I didn't realize you have to reverse all the hardware. I mean, look at all the tools I needed. I'm glad I had this nut driver too. It's the one I used to replace those nasty HVAC filters up on the roof. The LTT screwdriver is great for a lot of things, but there aren't really any hex nut bits that would fit inside it. But all's well that ends well, and I only made two little scratches on my brand new fridge. And if you wanted proof that my outlets are actually upside down, at least for the majority of appliances and extension cords I've ever seen, look at this. The fridge's power cord passes out the bottom. If this outlet was the other way around, the cord would drip any water on it right into the outlet. And it would be pulling itself out of the wall all the time too. And yes, I saw the technology connections video. And yes, in hospitals and some other environments, outlets are installed upside down on purpose. But no, there is no general code standard for it, and I doubt there ever will be. That is, unless we get actually good outlets someday, like the ones parts of Europe use, with multiple ground connections and a recessed outlet. But a power switch on the outlet? That's, that's not going to happen. The fridge works great, and it's nice to see at least some basic schematics are still given on these devices, but it's not quite as thorough or probably repairable as fridges used to be decades ago. But to christen my fridge, I bought three packs of soda. We got Diet Pepsi, Diet Dr. Pepper, and Diet Coke. It'll be interesting to see which one wins out. Of course, I, I think we all know how this battle's gonna go. And now I'm wondering which one's gonna generate more comments, me saying that the outlets are upside down again, or me saying that Diet Dr. Pepper is the best soda that ever was. But moving on, I got this tiny microwave and managed to set it up without any problems, except the power cord was a little too short. But no worries, I used a little extension. But now the question is, can I set the clock without consulting the manual at all? Well, it took a couple tries, but there it is. Now we'll see how good it is at timekeeping. I, I wonder why nobody has a PTP microwave clock yet. Maybe I can go that route with the CM4 someday. And construction-wise, the ceiling's almost completely in, the door hardware's on, and the door trim, well, it looks like they got the wrong hardware for this. The, the plans actually spec PEMCO kits, which are made with a specific sound rating. And I think we'll need new thresholds too. But we're getting there. The builder's gonna come back soon, and then I'll finally be able to do my measurements and see how well the studio treatment actually works. Oh, and I actually finished painting that front wall finally. I was procrastinating on it forever, but the builder said a cleaning crew was coming, so I wanted to get all my stuff up off the floor. I spent a day with my whole family joining in on the fun, and I got that last wall done finally. And I have to say, the shell white actually kind of looks good up here in the office. We kind of missed a bit on the ceiling tile color, but I'm kind of digging that black trim with white tile, and the shell white makes the room really have an 80s theme. I'm not really against that. But it was more painting, and you know how much I hate painting, but at least once and for all, finally, all the painting is done. Except for the back room, but I don't care much about that right now. And this week, St. Louis got even colder, getting down into the 20s. That's Fahrenheit. I'll put a translation of what that is in metric up here. And I noticed the heating wasn't keeping up with the temperature. I set it to 64 while I was away, but the temperature kept going lower than that. The thermostat was calling for heat all day long, but the heater wouldn't start heating. I called the HVAC company and after the tech came, he found this dry rotted fan belt. It was barely spinning the fan, so that also explains why I could barely feel any air moving when the fan was on. A few hundred bucks later, and now the system is blowing like a leaf blower, which is good and bad. I mean, it's pretty loud now with wind whipping around everywhere, and it also belched out like five years of dust and debris since I don't think the fan's been working for a really long time. But it is nice to be able to get five or 10 degrees hotter in like 10 minutes. And the new vent that they put here up in the studio with all of its 90 degree bends and the special sound treatment, 
it is a lot quieter. You can hear that as I walk from the front office into the studio. But now that the fan's moving so much air, it's probably loud enough that I'd want to automate turning off the system when I'm recording anyway. It's, it's not that hard to do in Home Assistant. And unless I'm doing hours of live streaming or something, I think the air in here will be fine. And just this week, I got the building and electrical inspections. The only thing that didn't pass was this fire hydrant. So I actually found the same model on the Cyber Monday sale cheaper than servicing this old one. So that'll come soon. And I just talked to the city and got my business license paid for. And that's in the mail. So we're just about to move in day. And to prep for that, I actually did one more little fix up in the studio. I cut out some extra rock wool and stuffed two layers above all the access holes in the ceiling. My hope is that that'll cut down on any remaining bits of noise that bounce around up in the ceiling. And it's, it's already pretty good in here, but I won't be able to do my final testing until the new door seals are in. But speaking of the ceiling, up in the office, I keep hearing weird knocking sounds. It turns out there's probably like a family of crows that lives nearby, and they go pick up things from the parking lot and bang them against one of the vents on my roof. I, I mean, it's fine by me, but now I kind of want to set up a nature camera up there so I can see what shenanigans they get up to. But I can't do any of that until I get networking nailed down. Until now, all my networking stuff's been on this rolling cart, but I needed that for the microwave. And I love the idea of a small wall rack after I read this comment on one of my older videos. I'm working on getting a full rack from someone local, and more on that later, but this wall rack has everything in it that I'll need for now, all running off two little UPSs. I still have some tidying up to do, but I'll run you through how I set this up. First, I marked off mounting locations for a three-quarters maple plywood board. It's actually pretty common to use ply for wall-mounted network or telecom equipment, though you don't have to go to the nines and buy something nice like maple. I knew I was going to paint it, so I spent the extra 10 bucks for sanded maple instead of pine. But why did I use this board? Well, it helps me mount the network rack exactly where I want it, especially since the rack's mounting holes are 18 inches apart. The wall studs are 16 inches on center. It's, it's much more stable to mount the board to the wall and the rack to the board. Plus, it gives me more options for mounting other stuff in the future. And also, the metal studs in this wall are hollow, so unlike wood studs, you have to plan out heavy wall-mounted stuff pretty carefully. In my case, I located the metal studs, leveled the board, then marked the stud locations on the board. I used my large carpenter square to mark off the line, which wasn't quite a perfect 90 degree angle. Then I drilled through the board at the tops and bottoms. I put in these togglers, and they work by pushing through a metal bracket that's held through the wall using a plastic grommet. You cinch that up to the wall and snap off the extra plastic bits. And it doesn't seem like it would hold much, but you can put a lot on each one of these since it spreads out the load on the metal stud through the 5 8 drywall we used here. So you could hang 100 pounds easy off any one of these screws. This board is a little bit annoying to maneuver if you're alone like I was, but I managed, and it's always nice when the install is actually level when you're all said and done. My dad helped me put together the rack, and I got a Navepoint 12U 4-post rack. I bought this one because it has a swing gate. The front part can actually swing out for easier access to the back of everything. I might or might not ever need to use that, but the rack is just over 100 bucks and feels nice and solid, so I'm overall pretty happy with it. The only annoying part is these side screws. I think they overspray the coating a bit heavy, so I had to basically recut the threads on each of the screw holes, and that's a lot of torque. I even stripped the head on one of the screws. I only had my LTT screwdriver, and I mentioned when I reviewed it, it's great for low torque, but you have to squeeze really hard to torque down screws like these. I used a torpedo level to get the rack positioned on the wall, then I marked the hole locations and drilled some pilot holes for the screws. It was a little awkward getting everything cinched up, but I checked level at the end and made sure the rack is solid on the wall. I could probably hang off it, but doing that could bend the frame a little bit, so I decided against it. I paused a bit while the ceiling tile installer was going, but then I got back to it and triple checked to make sure I had enough extra cable so I could move the main runs later on if I wanted. It's always better to leave a service loop than to have to extend a bunch of network cables. Before I started mounting any equipment, I wanted the board to blend in more, so I painted it. I put down a coat of primer, then a top coat, and it blends in nicely now. And yes, I had to do more painting. I think looking back on it, if I had known I was going to wall mount that rack, I would have had the carpenters put some blocking behind the wall. That way I could just drill straight into that and it probably would be even a tiny bit more sturdy too. But you can't plan for everything in construction so it's nice to have these options like these togglers. It was finally time to build out the rack and for now I just wanted to terminate the main Cat 6A runs. I don't know where my NVR will go or if I'll have a PoE switch in this mini rack so until I get those things sorted out I'm gonna leave the fiber and PoE wires bundled up. Now, I mentioned before, I originally planned on shielded cabling, so I bought a shielded patch panel too. It, it turns out I don't need it, but it is still pretty solid, and I love the cable management on it, and you'll see why soon. 
But for terminating the wires, I actually got this idea from a video by one of the most mellow sounding and fun network installers I've ever seen on YouTube, TCI Productions. I normally just work one cable at a time and sometimes I end up with a little too much slack or a run that's a little tighter than I wanted. But in his video, he showed just pulling each wire straight through the hole in the patch panel. Then you mark your cuts and work that way. In hindsight, that seems obvious, but the benefit is it makes your wire runs look perfect on the first try. That is, assuming you've kept the bundle nice and tidy, which I did using a bunch of Velcro cable wraps. But I pushed about 8 feet of cable back into the ceiling, then marked and started cutting all the patch cables for termination. I made sure to mark on each cable what it was before I cut it, just with a sharpie though. Then when I was happy with the order of the wires, I started printing out cable labels on the Brady. It has a setting for wire wrap, so it'll print the same text a bunch of times and you just wrap the printed label around the wire. I labeled all the wires, then got back to work terminating each one. Again, I'm using some shielded Cat6A keystone jacks. They don't have to be shielded, but they're still nice and solid. And when I tied them all into the patch panel, I also made sure to use the included zip tie to strap it to the retention bracket on the patch panel. This is like two layers of strain relief, and it's useful since these Cat6A plenum wires are actually really thick and heavy. You don't want them yanking on the connections if you drop the patch panel or something. So here's what that looked like in the end, and I'm sorry about having those labels slightly off from each other, and also about that upside down label that you probably just can't unsee now. Will I ever fix that? Maybe. We'll see. But I used some rack studs to pop in the patch panel, and I have it up here at the top. I'll either put a pass through or a switch right below it, but for now, those jacks will just sit dead. Hopefully I can borrow my dad's cable tester and get them checked out, or maybe I'll just plug something in on the other end and see if I can get 10 gigabits on each port. Now, the next thing was I needed to move the coax cable for my cable modem over to the new rack, and luckily the cable installers left me a big spool of extra wire. Unfortunately, they pre-terminated it for like a 100 foot run, which was way overkill, so I ended up with this big coil in the rack. I'll cut that down to size and re-terminate it later. But with that over in the rack, I could finally move all my network gear over to the new rack location. First, I moved one of my two mini UPSs, then I moved my cable modem, OpenSense router, QNAP switch, Home Assistant Yellow, and security system. I didn't have any time that day to mount up anything or cable manage, so it was a bit of a mess, but I finally plopped my access point on top of the rack and called it a day. Total network downtime was under three minutes, so not too bad. I mean, besides the security system, there isn't anything critical on here yet, but it's nice to have a network set up so small you can move it in less than a few minutes. But this setup was looking a little sloppy with the wires just hanging from the ceiling, the AP sitting on the rack, and the power going all over the place. So I tidied up the install. I wall mounted the UPS and zipped some straps in to hold the cable. I mounted the AP above it, and even though it's facing the wrong way here, I can still get a full signal up in the front office. I'll figure out a better spot for the AP eventually though. I bought this cable raceway and bundled up the wires inside, so now they're nice and contained too. And once the main rack arrives, I'll decide what to do with the rest of the wires over here. I'd really like to find a way to rack mount the cable modem, ideally in one U, but maybe two U, but we'll, we'll see. But as a quick overview, today in my rack I have OpenSense and WireGuard running on this fanless mini PC. It gets internet from my cable modem and passes it through to this little QNAP switch. That goes to my Home Assistant Yellow and to my Netgear AP for Wi-Fi. And the Simply Safe only works on Wi-Fi, which is a little annoying, but it's been stable. And of course there's a train going by right as I'm recording this last little bit, but I'm going to be putting the switch up here where these rack studs are, and I'm wondering, is there anything else you want to see? And is there anything you'd do different? Please let me know in the comments, and thanks so much to all my patrons and GitHub sponsors. You're the ones who are making it so I can do all this stuff, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great holiday season, and until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.